Welcome back to Fireside, a podcast from FS Investments. I'm Laura Rehm, Chief U.S. Economist here at FS, and today we are recording our annual Market Madness. You guessed it, in honor of the NCAA basketball tournament, we have created a bracket of our 16 ideas that could influence markets over the coming year. Some are obvious, some are here on a repeat appearance, and some are long shots, right? Like any good tournament. Let's introduce the other folks on our panel before we really get into the competition. I'm joined by our head of private wealth solutions, Rob Hoffman. Rob, are you ready to go today? Hello. I am super excited. Also here is Andrew Kors, an executive director on the team who's our thought leader on commercial real estate and equity markets in general. Andrew, welcome. Hey, Laura. I got some shots up pregame. I'm excited to go. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we've all, we've all gotten up for the game. I have. I know I have. Finally, making his FS Fireside debut and rounding out our panel is Alan Flanagan. Alan is not only a terrific new addition to our team, but he has also co-authored a white paper recently on private equity secondaries. It's some of the smartest education around on this topic, so do yourselves a favor and look it up. And there's another reason Alan's here. He was in the NCAA tournament for Lafayette in 2015. So while his market insights are going to be valuable, I'm hoping he'll give us a little peek into the intensity of that experience. And Alan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I didn't realize I'd still be rehashing my college basketball exploits (laughs) this many years later, but uh, glad that it's uh, paid off here. So privileged to be here. Um, All right. Let's talk about the tournament. The brackets, as we record today, the bracket isn't out yet. Um, we're recording on March 13th. So the bracket's coming out this coming weekend. Selection and, Sunday. Yeah, Selection Sunday. Andrew, you, as we, as anybody who's been a frequent visitor of this podcast recognizes, Andrew is a rabid Villanova fan. Mm-hmm. Are you guys in this year, Chance? Well, we'll see. I'm not sure when this podcast will come out. Um, but as of now, I would say we're firmly on the bubble, um, which means that it's it's really going to, you know, only time will tell whether whether we get a bid. Not too much time, though, because this... Yeah, within, within the next week, we yeah, will know. Next week, yep, yeah, yep. And Alan, Lafayette, any chance? Lafayette is out. Season is over. Lost in the uh, conference ah. tournament. So we're okay. a one-bid league. If you don't get that one bid, no chance of the at-large bid. All right. So and do any of you have teams in? Uh, Nebraska. Oh, Nebraska. For, like, the first time in a decade. The Cornhuskers. Number three in the Big Ten, double bye in the conference yes. tournament. Yes. Super excited. So that's who we'll all root for. Yeah, that's how that'll be our team of absolutely. teams this year. <laughs> this will be their chance to get their first win ever in the tournament. That being said, I th- it's like a 99.7% chance they're in, you know, when you look at the prognosticators. But <laughs> so you were we'll saying the co- they have a good coach. Yeah. Coach of the year in the Big Ten. That's awesome. Excited. That's awesome. Are you going to like go be able to go to any of the games or are you that big of a fan or are you just going to have like a viewing party at your house? I mean, it's. But we'll see where they're playing, but it might be a little bit difficult to make it to yeah, the game. But, yeah. you know, we'll see. You're on the I road like a going. lot. You never know. Stars I, lo- the I love watching them on TV and yeah, seeing my parents go. sitting in their seat kind of behind the hood. Oh, that's awesome. You know, that's pointing great. out the grandparents to the kids when they're on TV. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So. So it's a it's a family institution. Uh, I've been I've been going my whole yeah, life. For, for a football it. school, it's it's yeah. pretty cool to get basketball <laughs> in the line right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good stuff. Well, I know we'll all be uh, making good use of the time to to enjoy the tournament and 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 do that. All right, so let me explain what we're doing today with our market madness, um, which is a bracket of our sixteen top ideas that we think could influence markets over the next year, and. We, uh, the brackets online. So I hope that you will have an opportunity to just sneak a peek at it, um, and kind of frame out the conversation. I think we're going to go region by region first. Does that sound like a good plan to everybody? All right. So our first region, our number one seed is inflation up against crypto resurgence. That's our dark horse. And then Um, We're going to have another game between China devaluation and CRE refi meltdown. That sounds like a terrible team to root for. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. That's uh... (laughs) (laughs) and yet it keeps coming up as something that could influence markets over the next year. 
Yep. That's I'm, that's the way that we're framing this conversation. I'm glad I was assigned to that team. Right. Well, like <laughs> even if the team is bad, the idea is that if it is going to be a really dominant influence, that could be what some teams have won ugly in the past. And yeah. that's, that's certainly possible. <laughs> you know? I love that phrase. All right. So uh, I'll start us off um, inflation and I will uh, I will pass off crypto resurgence to Alan. I'm excited to take it. The Alan, plucky underdog. <laughs> the plucky <laughs> underdog. That's right. It, let's uh, let's let's make your case for why you think crypto resurgence is going to be the dominant influence in markets for the next year. Sure. So I mean, I'm used to being in the underdog position in the tournament. You know, when we were there, we were 16 seed going up against the Villanova Wildcats as the one. Andrew's beloved franchise, oh, great yes. college program. Andrew, were you at Villanova? Then? I was a senior. Yeah. Yeah. And you were both wow. seniors at the same time. We were. That's Only right. he was on the court and you were. I was in my tiny little living room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But in any event, but I enjoyed the game more than Alan did, I think. Yeah. I, I think so too. <laughs> Sounds like and, it. uh, you know, I'll make my best effort here for crypto resurgence to do better than my beloved leopards did that day. So here we go. So crypto resurgence. Let's focus on Bitcoin to start. It's the, the, the oldest, most established of the cryptocurrencies. It really serves as a proxy for the market. And with the run-up uh, to start this year, it's now at a $1.4 trillion market cap. And this is on the back of news of spot ETFs being approved in January, uh, which, have attracted, uh, have, which have attracted pretty considerable flows. I mean, BlackRock's attracted $15.4 billion, Fidelity $9.2 billion, and the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, kind of the longest lasting uh, now ETF as of two months ago in the space is up to 27, $27.7 billion. So meaningful money going into this space. And the returns have been very strong on the back of this. You know, if you think about last year, maybe a little bit of a crypto winter, but now we're in the spring and spring has certainly sprung uh, across this space. So year to date returns of over 72% for Bitcoin, a one year returns in excess of 200%. And if you go back five years, you've had an annualized return of 80%. High popping results, but certainly it's something where volatility along the way is 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 integral to the story you know, as we approach the halving cycle for Bitcoin here in the next month or so, uh, expected to be in April, according to Coinbase. Now, that's an event that Bitcoin enthusiasts have been marking on their calendars for years. Much like we do the tournament every year, they mark that halving cycle, and you know, with that, um, you know, they they yeah, you know, this is something that increases the deflationary aspect of Bitcoin and is something sure. that Bitcoin enthusiasts point to as providing a lot of price support. Awesome. Um, well, that was mm. a very strong case for crypto. I think the question is, does it influence other markets significantly? That's the issue, right? Because, Absolutely. you know, here, here I am and I'm not going to lie. Inflation has been my top pick, not just this round, but prior mm -hmm. podcast, you know, last year in reason. the tournament, it was because I see inflation is really at the center of, um, the dynamics driving interest rates higher, all else equal equity markets, um, which are responding a lot to CPI data and other wage data to, um, even clearly real estate markets, you know, things that, you know, there are, um, many different markets that are really, um, taking inflation, um, which leads to Fed expectations and um, running with that. So inflation today, you know, yesterday we got the February CPI report um, with inflation at 3.2% year over year was a second upside surprise in a row. And, you know, CPI has really been flattened above 3% now since June of last year. Um, I will actually say it hasn't influenced markets as much as I would have thought over the last year. <laughs> But uh, but I think over the coming year, it's it's going to be a, a pretty big influence. So um, what do you think, guys? Do you think I won that I, round? I or, mean, the, or no? the thing is, like crypto, it's had multiple crypto winters, <laughs> yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It right. happens and it's crazy volatile, but it doesn't seem to really spread beyond crypto. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, and it also, I mean, to simplify things kind of feels like just a levered play on kind of speculative tech, you know, yeah, like it, yeah. it seems to trade with like the NASDAQ and I'm not sure it, it, crypto is necessarily the one driving the market. It's kind of the market driving yeah. Yeah. crypto performance. Yeah. So great way to put it. All right. Um, Alan, great case. I think we're going to advance inflation. Try to make my most passionate argument. Right. Maybe the most passionate <laughs> argument I've ever made for I felt Bitcoin. It. I heard it. It was in the room. <laughs>
<laughs> the next head-to-head is CRE Refi Meltdown. Andrew, clearly that is the one that you are going to be talking us through that team's chances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've given myself one that has come up. I'm going to channel my old foreign exchange days because China and the risk of devaluing the renminbi is something that I think is starting to bubble up. Um, why don't you take us through your CRE refi meltdown and why you think that could be a big influence in markets over the next year? Sure. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to take some liberties here because there are no rules in market. No madness. rules at all. Um, and there's no referee here. There's no referee here at all. It's, it's anarchy. Only madness. Um, <laughs> so I, I think sort of taking the word meltdown out of this, I do think this, uh, this team has, a, ha, has a decent chance of, of advancing here. Um, look, I, I think, the reality is there are about six to eight hundred billion dollars of CRE debt outstanding that needs to be refinanced in the next year. Um, that is a fact. Um, a lot of these other uh, sort of factors are uncertain as to whether they'll happen at all. We know that there is this this refinancing wave in, in the commercial real estate debt markets. Again, six to eight hundred billion dollars over the next year, about two trillion dollars over the next three years. That's significant, right? Lots, sure. lots of borrowers, lots of property owners are going to see that. And it comes up all the time. It does. It does. Absolutely. And you hear refi wall, I prefer refi wave, but, um, you know, look, lots of borrowers are going to have to refinance into this environment where interest rates have really more than doubled, um, in terms of CRE mortgage rates. So the interest expense for these borrowers is going to increase significantly. Again, as we've talked about, the good news is fundamentals outside the office sector are really strong. And most of these borrowers, you know, are, are, are sitting on assets that they want to continue to support. The issue is going to be that they're going to have to sort of inject new equity into these into these properties to continue to support them and to, to sort of meet the refinancing needs of these lenders. Um, you know, I think are there going to be some issues in the office sector? Are there going to be some issues at certain banks that are sort of overexposed to parts of the market? I think yes, um, and the Fed has sort of you know put out some some statements about you know concerns around the office sector. But I think um, you know. As we go throughout the year, there's going to be more news sort of mostly around the office sector here. Um, but the other thing is it presents a massive opportunity for lenders in the market, right? Sure. We've talked about banks and CMBS market, uh, excuse me, the CMBS market having stepped back a bit. There are these alternative lenders that can come into the market and meet this big need. So I think when you think about, you know, an issue like this where we definitely have to address it, um, there could be some risks along the way and it presents a massive investment opportunity as well. I think that that presents a pretty strong case for this being a a, a big market factor over the yeah, next year. Sure. And I think, you know, I, I'm going to talk a second about China because, um, you know, when you look at the globe and the global economy, China's slowdown has certainly, I think, is really notable. It's really obvious and it's getting a lot of attention. And the reason why I think China's the possibility of China devaluing their currency is coming up is because it's a potential release valve that could further um, uh, accelerate their export machine, their domestic export machine. And um, and I put it there because, um, you know, the reality is that while I don't see in and of itself China's weak growth impacting the U.S. economy, I think there's a much greater chance that it impacts financial markets. You know, we've talked about supply chain disruption and that release valve of the currency, it's kind of already slowly happening. I'm going to put on everyone's radar that the renminbi is trading at 734 um, to the dollar. That was its high um, that we hit just in September 2023. That's the high since like they uh, broke their peg back in the mid to 2000s. Mm. Um, and that was um, only six months ago. And over, you know, since, you know, kind of over the last year, call it year and a half, it's fallen 14% versus the dollar. So they're already, I think, kind of like weakening their currency at the margin. It's not a, a whole scale. And, and, and there's only yeah. so many levers on growth that China can pull. That's I mean, they, the point. they don't want to reinflate the real estate market that, you know, the infrastructure yes. yeah, is just going to add more debt to the economy. And, you know, China's, there's not much room for fiscal stimulus. And they're never going to stimulate the consumer because they never have. So. Right, right. <laughs> The export and, and market is really where where the game is at. And local um, governments just are tapped out. They yeah. don't have the, the room for the yeah. fiscal squeeze. So um, I think when I think about what could influence markets, um, I think we look at, you know, the likelihood in the U.S. that it's really a, a CRE 
um, either anxiety, which I think you and I don't feel is warranted. I think that's got to advance, even though I think it's worthwhile yeah. having the discussion on China. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I agree. Certainly. All right. Um, let's move to the next region. And here I'll turn it over to Rob and Alan. Here, here's our next region because it gets very, I think, banking related, very um, credit related. Um, rate, Fed rate cuts, more regional bank failures, tight credit spreads, and geopolitical tensions. So, Rob, uh, why don't you and Alan take those number two and number three seeds? Tell us what they are and why you think they're going to influence markets. Yeah. So if I take the number two seed, tight credit spreads, look, credit markets – generally speaking across the board, have had a pretty good run following the volatility in, in 2022. And, and floating rate credit for that standpoint generally did okay in 22 against a backdrop of falling equity markets. But things rallied really strongly in 2023. This year has been off to a pretty good start. And when we look at spreads across markets like high yield loans, high grade, I mean, if you, if you rank things on a percentile basis where they've been in history, High yields, 86th percentile. Loans, 50th. High grade, 77. CLO single A's, 66. Um, European markets for high yield, almost 80%. Like on a spread basis, spreads are relatively tight. Uh, I think they're tight for a reason. It reflects a lot of the good returns, relatively low default rates. Companies are still in pretty good position. Economic growth is good. It supports that. But I, agree. I think from a pure spread perspective, uh, I think a lot of people look at these markets and say, man, spread, spreads are kind of tight. And does that not pose a challenge that could spread uh, to other yeah. parts <laughs> of the market <laughs> if I they were the to pun. widen and you get some <laughs> big price moves and these markets start to go down? You know, I think I think there's a case to be made there. Uh, that it, but that you it know could what my answer to the concern that it's not a good time to invest in credit because credit spreads aren't wide is like is like we're now in a world where core interest rates are five, four to five percent. Yeah. Like total I, yield is really, and I think market, that simple fact is just still lost on so many investors in this space. Well, not to talk against my own position, but I do agree. If you look at those same percentiles on a yield basis, high yields only at 50%. U.S. loans are only at 11%. CLOs only at 12%. Like on a yield perspective, markets are still exceptionally attractive. Yeah. And I think that's created a lot of demand for credit product combined with, again, the reasonably good economic conditions means companies are generally in good space and yields are super attractive. So yes, spreads are tight, but the yield argument does kind of offset Well, I mean, and, and we wrote we wrote tight credit spreads, but I feel like we could have yeah. just written credit spreads because I think that's yeah. something that like a lot of investors are like still watching this like day-to-day -day movement in spreads. And it's like when corn rates were zero, that was all yeah. your return was yeah. reliant on. And now you can kind of just like focus back more on fundamentals and yeah. let the yield do its work for you. Yeah. And no, it's true. Um, it's true. All right. I, I don't, you don't, I don't need to sell you a, a credit fund. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're all in. <laughs> Alan, <laughs> take yes. us through your team. <laughs> so I've got geopolitical tensions here as the three seed and you know, this is one that can be an all-encompassing topic. You can think about, you know, tensions between China and Taiwan, uh, certainly what's going on in the Middle East with Israel and, and Gaza and, you know, the Russian-Ukrainian war. And, you know, these are all things that have a very human element and, you know, a situation where first and foremost, you know, you think about the human toll that these conflicts take. And, you know, certainly, you know, thoughts and prayers with all those that have suffered throughout and, you know, hoping that that, that the resolution is is on the on the horizon in each of these scenarios. And to be clear, when we say we're rooting for a team to move forward, in no way are we rooting for any sort of Correct. like geopolitical exactly. tension. We're simply thinking about like what would be the most likely to influence markets. So, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's our framework by which we're looking at this. Uh, certainly not uh, advancing these on, you know, cheering for an outcome here. So, you know, I'll take us through the economic side of things as well, too. And you know, here it's helpful to step back a little bit and, you know, what is war from an economic perspective? It's, it's a commodity and an inflation story. You know, you can think, you know, when the soldiers are off fighting wars, they aren't at home farming or working in factories producing goods that cause supply chain disruptions. You have physical supply chain disruptions as a result of war. And these all cause supply side shocks in terms of inflation dynamics. And, uh, you know, speaking specifically about Russia and Ukraine, 
This is a good example because these are two major commodity producers in Europe. And the inflationary result of that is, is obvious. You know, everybody knows the story with oil and wheat, but it's also nickel, copper, iron, palladium, platinum, titanium for the aerospace industry. And, you know, I remember in the early days of the conflict breaking out, you know, everybody was figuring out, oh, neon, 90% of it's produced in Russia. And where do they uh, refine it after it's produced in Russia? Ukraine. Right. So, you know, this is a key uh, ingredient in the semiconductor manufacturing process. And this is an example, I think, that we've experienced multiple times in the past few years now, be it the COVID lockdowns and restrictions, but it's companies having to gain a better understanding of their supply chains. And like that conflict's already in play. I think this is asking like if they're going to be more like breaking out, widening, Certainly. spreading, or do we think it's going to well, sort I, of I, like I, I think we're seeing it with, um, you know, with, the, with what's going on in the Middle East. Sure. And, uh, you know, and the, the reroutings from the Red Sea around the, you know, the Horn of Africa, yes, yeah. is, at, that continues to worsen actually. And, not, and it, it hasn't impacted, you know, things too significantly yet, but, but, you know, as shipping rates go up, we could see, you know, that sort of flow through to inflation as well. Sure. Well, totally. and I think commodity prices haven't moved yet, but to me, yeah. that's like going to be the biggest potential mm-hmm. point of, tr- of intersection with yeah. like our economy and markets. It seems yeah. like oil above a hundred is some sort of like place that markets just get yeah. really and, uncomfortable. And you think about, fundamentals and you think about China, U.S., like, I mean, the U.S. just passed, um, I think something through Congress l- looking to ban TikTok. There could be some retribution from TikTok where they're banning, you know, Facebook products. Like, uh, sure. it's, you know, there's there's all these issues between the U.S. and China where we, we still don't really know how they're yeah. going to end. Yeah. Yeah. And so the risk of a broader escalation in the Middle East certainly is a threat. You know, fortunately, with where it's contained right now, there's not a lot of uh, major global economic impact. Obviously, shipping routes affected, um, but not major commodity exporters. That's why I give the example of Russia and Ukraine to illustrate how an escalation kind of can be a significant market event yeah. when it involves these types of yeah. producers. Yeah. All right. Well, you've talked me into it. I feel like that's uh, that's the one that advances because, you know, I think credit fundamentals yeah. now should be more the focus than credit spreads. And yeah. so as we look forward to the next year, I think that left hill risk of some bigger event or, mm-hmm. you know, I, I really it, like it takes a real commodity like, prices. Like financial banking crisis for credit markets to be the thing that moves everything. Everything else. A lot of times it's it's these other factors that then impact credit, not the other way around. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, Let's move on to, I I will briefly mention, because I want to move to our third region. You know, rate cuts are another number one seed in that second region that we talked about. Um, You know, bank failures, it was the number four seed they were up against. I... That is also a left tail risk that should be on all of our radar, but we've already had two and it did not cause a broader um, market reaction. I think Fed rate cuts yeah. are still going to be the major focus. Would you agree with that, Andrew? What yeah, I mean, the, the Fed reacted pretty strongly to the to the spring 23 yeah. bank failures. And I think that knowledge for the market should keep them fairly confident that they know how the Fed will react yeah. if there's more issues. I think we can take some some confidence in that. Um, our next region um, is uh, going to be, we're going to move through that one quickly. I think we have, um, Andrew, I want you to give us, and I, I, I signed you too, because these are both related to equity markets, which of course, you know, are, I feel like a driving force in overall markets. Um, you know, yeah. equities are really um, often sort of the the guiding sun. And when we think about the big um, drivers in equity markets, I have given you two pretty tricky ones. Uh, small and mid-cap comeback and an AI reality check. Mm-hmm. Don't call it a comeback. <laughs> um, so the SMIDs, yeah. So on SMIDs, I mean, they've, they've really underperformed markets over the past three years. Uh, you know, U.S. SMID caps have underperformed large caps by 14% the past year, 50% the past three years, just massive underperformance. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not as dramatic outside the U.S., um, but but it's it's definitely still there in other markets as well. I, th- I think the reality is, if you look at if you look at this from a fundamental perspective, the gap between just the profitability and the margin dynamics at these large caps, especially the mega cap U.S. companies have just that, that gap between large and small cap has just really widened. And as we've talked about, you know, on other podcasts, the the quality of the small and mid cap market 
um, in terms of just the pure beta of that market has, has, has really degenerated. There's, you know, 35 to 40% of those companies don't have any positive earnings. Wow. So when you're talking about just the pure market, um, it's not a very high quality market anymore. So really it's, it's, it's a valuation um, sort of play right now yeah. where you've got PE ratios that are like, you know, 0.75, mm-hmm. that of the large cap market. So you're really betting on that valuation. Um, the way we we would prefer to play that is more sort of looking for the highest quality names in this mid market um, that has sort of gotten beat down just because that's the market they're in and that market has underperformed. Sure. But by and large, I, I I'm not sure at this point in the cycle you want to be buying broad beta to to small and mid cap companies. Okay. Um, and then on the AI side, I, I think you know a little more interesting probably, um, you know. A, a broad estimation of how much wealth the AI, you know, trade has has netted is around five trillion dollars, um, just in the U.S. Wow. Um, just using sort of an ETF that tracks, you know, companies in the AI space. Is that a big number? Five trillion. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not small. It's not small. Yeah. Yeah, tri- uh, two with a TR. The, trillion. The, the U.S. market's about forty-five trillion. So you can say, wow. you've added one ninth of the uh, the U.S. equity market cap in the past it's year just on AI alone, wow. <laughs> and forty percent of that's Nvidia. So, so here's the real question, though. Is it a bubble like the tech bubble? Is that what we're seeing again? Yeah, it's incredibly exciting. And th- my goal here is not to be a Debbie Downer, but that's the task that I was I was I was given here. <laughs> um, I think I think, you know, if it is a bubble right now, it would be more of a fundamental bubble than a valuation one. If you actually look at NVIDIA, their P.E. ratios come down, come way down because earnings expectations have come up so oh, much. Okay. Hmm. So the question is just like. Will the earnings be as spectacular as people think? Right, Nvidia's forward earnings have quintupled over the past nine months. Yeah. Like, wow! It's just incredible the the surge in profitability that we've actually seen in the reports. It's not just expectations; we've seen it. Um, I think as this goes forward, though, more issues will arise around political. Right, as it as it takes more jobs from from certain industries, will you know politicians come in to try to sort of protect their their districts? Um, regulatory, right? As as security issues come up, um, yeah. You know, and reality check doesn't have to be negative. It can just sure. be like taking the air <laughs> out of the actually, balloon a little it can bit. Be you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. As, as, as we look to implement it sustainably in yeah. our society, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, of course, environmental in in terms of the the, the amount of power and electricity and you know, water that's used um, to make some of these you know Nvidia semiconductors sure. that are used in these data centers. So, I think you know, given how much wealth has been created on the back of that. There's a lot of sort of dynamics that could that could come into play where um, you know it's swinging the market one way or the other. So I think yeah. this could really come into play over the next year as sort of society comes to grips with how this how this uh, you know is implemented. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it is to think that Nvidia with the incredible run that it's had. But the PE ratio has gone down. It's, I mean, it's, it's come down by like half. Yeah. It's like that's 33 inc- right now or 34. Yeah. And it was like 70. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Crazy. Yeah. Um, All right. So you're advancing. Which one are you advancing? I think, you know, as, as, as much as I would like to, you know, go buy smids at the bottom, I, I think, I think AI, AI reality check, given the wealth that it's created is, is the winner here. I, AI seems to be the dominant discussion topic yeah, yeah. every time. It's Absolutely. like on the way yeah. up. Mm-hmm. It will certainly be if there is some kind of reality check. Yeah. And and I wanted to kind of answer the own question, my own question that I threw out to you, which is something I get a lot. You know, is this a repeat of the tech bubble um, in the late 90s? And I just think there are lots of reasons why, you know, those companies weren't profitable. There were not positive earnings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A very different from today. But I think your point is really important that, it, you know, yeah. I, and I don't want to even use the B word, but like a reality check can come on fundamentals alone. It doesn't have to come from 100%. some yeah. sort of, you know, radical. A company can be mega pr- profitable today, price, price. but that doesn't mean they're going to be mega profitable in three years. Yeah. So, All right. All we'll right. Say. AI reality check. I hope that was, didn't feel too bearish to you. No, I, I mean, I <laughs> hope I didn't sound too bearish. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alan, I'm going to give you the next matchup. Um, you know, middle market, U.S. middle market versus fiscal outlook. Thanks, Laura. So the U.S. middle market, we'll just frame out the discussion in terms of what we mean a bit. So this is a, a, a subsector within the U.S. economy that, impo- that in, involves nearly 200,000 businesses, represents a third of private sector GDP, and employs approximately 48 million people. Uh, revenues for these businesses are between 10 million and 100 billion. 
And this is a market where we've seen consistent outperformance uh, on the growth side of things. So in 2023, across this segment of the market, revenues increased for 83% of middle market companies and an average revenue growth rate of 12.4% over the year, which was an all-time high uh, for this segment of the market. And Does that compare to the S&P 500 or outpace it? I mean, I turned to my equity strategist, Mr. Yeah. Kors, over <laughs> here. Er, earnings were down in, in 2023 for yeah. uh, yeah. the S&P outside the MAG-7. Yeah. So I don't think 83% of companies were, <laughs> were growing earnings. Yeah, so, yeah it's great. Yeah. So, and, and this is a market that can help investors address one of the main challenges of the day, which is, Everybody needs some allocation to growth in their portfolio, whether you're in retirement and you're concerned about the possibility of outliving your assets or whether you're very much still in the wealth and accumulation phase of your life. This is a core fundamental need within a portfolio. When you look at U.S. public equity markets and you say, okay, valuations are pretty high, uh, you're very concentrated in your growth stocks and a few you know, large cap tech platform names externally outside the U.S., there's a lot of reason for skepticism as well, too. Uh, valuations are a bit more attractive, sure, but there's many other problems that plague the rest of the world where the U.S. has leadership position that insulate it from some of the rest of the world's problems. We're also a fairly insular economy, and you see that within the U.S. middle market, where the main market in which these companies operate is the U.S., where the consumer is still well, strong yeah. and household balance sheets are still And this still speaks adequate. to one of the discussion points that we just had earlier, like geopolitical tensions. If you're... This is a place where you are a little more insulated from Absolutely. geopolitics yeah. where, you know, energy independent, food independent, um, and really unlike the S&P 500, which is a very international index, our economy mm -hmm. is quite closed. You know, we don't, trade is only what, 15% of, of the yeah, economy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, no and, currency risk. And <laughs> as investors think about getting equity and growth exposure within their portfolio, diving down into the U.S. middle market, which is a market that there are becoming more ways to access this part of the market for investors, which is critical because if you look at the cohort of companies there, 87% of U.S. companies with more than $100 million in revenue are private companies. Yeah. So if you want to have an equity allocation that gives you exposure to the broad market and you don't have exposure to this part of the market, you're missing out on a significant amount. Well, it's, and it's interesting, you know, not to belabor the point, but the comment that Andrew made on SMID, that if you look at the SMID market, yeah. so publicly traded small and mid-sized companies, you made the comment that they're not particularly high quality today with a yeah. lot of them that... I mean, a lot of who's IPO'd are, are, are companies in like biotech and software yeah. that, that don't have positive earnings yet. And a, a lot of the companies in the other sectors have, have stayed private. Yeah. But meanwhile, the U.S. middle market, which is largely private, still has really good yeah. fundamental characteristics. So Absolutely. You know, to your point, Alan, that, that, that providing access to... You can't just go buy a SMID fund and say, okay, well, I've got U.S. mid market exposure because so many of those companies are not public anymore. Yeah. Like they might've been a decade or so more that, ago. So that, that influences other markets because it, what it's positive fundamentals as mm -hmm. you know, the clue they have a large, they employ a lot of people in the U S and it's they, a wider opportunity set. It's not right. just tech software businesses. You can get growth in industrials, healthcare, a variety of sectors. It's just a more diverse environment from which to pick companies for awesome. your growth exposure. Okay. So I put you up against U S fiscal outlook, which Oof. Is probably not that good, <laughs> but I mean, you say, you say, oh, but, but to me, like I, I sure. put it in the bracket because yeah. listen, like supply side dynamics on treasuries are not great. Mm -hmm. You know, where we keep, um, you know, get as the new budget shows, um, we're not going to do a good job closing <laughs> the gap anytime soon. Oh. And, um, and so the fiscal outlook to me is really similar. It's sort of the, the same side of the other side of the coin is mm -hmm. debt dynamics and debt outstanding, yeah. which is enormous and I think could have a big influence on markets should we get like a failed treasury auction. So, mm -hmm. and um, it, you know, it helps the Congress has passed a spending bill this past week, uh, avoid shutdown for the near term. Yeah. Uh, but it'll be a topic that comes up again in the fall, sure. particularly in an election season. It's not being naive that just because there's yeah. an election folks won't hold the budget hostage. So it, it, but the question is impact to the market right. of the coming year. And I think you know, what we've seen in the past is that yes, there are fits and starts when it comes to budget making, occasionally some shorter term ramifications, but long term, you know, there is, you know, th these are not major black swan events that affect the markets in a significant way. Gotcha. All right. So it sounds like you want to, like you're pushing to progress U.S. middle market as a broader sort of ballast for overall markets. Yeah. I think that's the more compelling story for investors. Right. And All that, right. I mean, maybe a more near term compelling. I mean, I think the, the big worry, right, is one day the U.S. One fiscal day. outlook yeah. is a it is a big issue for this economy. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
No, I agree. I mean, you really, you know, when we look at the long run charts, sort of, you know, one to 10 years, it's, it's really scary. Um, mm-hmm. But we want to keep this yeah. upbeat and not <laughs> terrify everybody with the U.S. <laughs> deficit outlook. All right. Last quadrant. I'm going to take the top one. Uh, I have given myself household delinquency rates versus trade policy. And um, when I think about what could impact the economy, I don't think we can discount the um, these are kind of maybe two scary things like, um, you know, household delinquency rates are rising. You look at auto delinquencies, um, credit card delinquencies, they're both back well above where we were pre-pandemic. Remember, they all dipped during the pandemic because we couldn't like go out and spend our money. So we kind of paid down our debt and people got a nice bolus from the from the government. And rates were zero. That helped. <laughs> right. Totally. Um, and I think uh, so now, um, you know, they have really, I think, risen beyond where they were before the pandemic. And um, for both autos and credit cards at the highest since 2011, which was not a good time in the economy. So that is absolutely something to keep our eye on. The outlook for the U.S. consumer remains solid. The unemployment rate has been below 4% for two years now, and real income growth is positive. So, um, you know, while excess savings has been eroded, um, people tend to spend alongside with income, but household delinquencies we need to keep our eye on very closely. Um, and trade policy, I think is something that's unlikely to affect our economy this year. I'm going to advance household delinquency, but I'm not going to skip over the fact that trade policy needs to remain at the forefront. Um, the Biden administration continues a lot of the policies actually that, that Trump put into place. And, um, obviously if we get, you know, Trump reelected, he's promised significant new tariffs. There's going to be a lot of moving parts on that front. And I think, you know, that still is something that I, I keep while I'm not going to advance it. Um, I think we need to remember it as a left tail possibility for broader markets, which are heavily international. it, It seems like reversing globalization is becoming more and more bipartisan. Yeah. So it's, it's more of a question of magnitude than Mm -hmm. direction. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. For our last matchup, this is going to be a tight competition. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew and Rob to break down the head-to-head competition between managing the Magnificent Seven, what that's going to look like over the coming Mm -hmm. year, and Rob, this idea of cash on the sidelines, which you can explain to us what I mean by that. Yeah. Rob, you want to take it first? Sure. I mean, $6 trillion of cash sitting in money market That's also a big number. Yeah, six, pretty big, you know, pretty big. Uh, there was, call it three trillion three years ago or so. Yeah, so that's incredible. Uh, and look, as sitting here in the seat of a working at an asset manager, I mean, I think one of the largest sources of competition for a- anyone who's trying to get investor dollars into a fund is, well, how is that going to do relative to cash? Because if I can earn five plus in cash right now by earning, you know, T-bills and money market funds, like, What's the compelling investment rationale to do almost anything else? Yeah. And it is certainly a major source of competition. Uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting in that. What, this is why I remind everyone that inflation is still like 3%. So yeah. 5% mm-hmm. isn't what you yeah. would yeah. think it would be. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and what could cause that cash to come off the sidelines and move into markets? I think one of the things that's interesting is as, as rates have gone up and these yields have become really attractive, um, the, I think the relative opportunity in cash versus other things has shrunk. But if we think about the other side of this and what happens if rates decline, the absolute level of yield that someone is going to be able to earn in one of these money market accounts is going to go down. And it will go down in a direct relationship to what the Fed does with rates. Right. But when we think about you know, whether it's earnings yields and equities or high yield bonds or private credit or any of these other yield generative asset classes, the actual relative gain in those asset classes becomes even more attractive as rates go down. So could that cause a flood of some of this money to move into these markets as the Fed is cutting rates to provide stimulus to some other sectors? Or is there something else that just causes this cash to come off the sidelines, the AI trade, whatever it is, it sort of reinvigorates Bitcoin. investors. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin yeah. 
to want to move that money out of a money market where to your point that the real return is not as good as just the absolute level of the nominal return. It, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it's flows matter. There. Flows it, matter. It is Absolutely. sitting there. I, I also think that last year gave us a powerful reminder that there's an opportunity cost to yeah. sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. And I think that's going to, yeah. I think, motivate a lot of people to, you know, deploy that cash. Yeah. I mean, high yield was up 14%. Yeah. And if you were like my dad, who is a retiree and, oh, if I can earn 5% on my bank CD, I'm not doing anything else. But you just gave up almost 10% worth of mm -hmm. return by not investing into the market. Did and you tell him a, that? Yeah, you know, he, he wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> He's got Nebraska on the He's mind. He's setting his ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andrew, how do you manage the MAG-7, this concentration? I mean, the next to me, I, I, I feel pretty good about this squad. I mean, to me, this is the question in global markets today. It is. I mean, seven stocks... It's now 30% of the S&P 500. We have all of our eggs in one basket. Seven really, eggs in one basket. Yeah. <laughs> seven, seven eggs in one basket. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, 30% of the S&P 500. That's up from 22%. What's the basketball corollary? Is this a team with like one player and all of yeah, our performance like, is concentrated <laughs> in that one person? You got to play like boxing one against this team, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, just, just, you know, track them around the court. So again, almost a third of the market, you know, historically they've traded very tightly to each other. Um, just because they're, you know, they're all growth companies. They all kind of respond similarly to interest rates. Sure. Recently, it, it's interesting. They've kind of split into, I would say, trifurcated into three, <laughs> into three, three kind of separate groups. You kind of have NVIDIA, which is in its own kind of world right now. Um, you've got Microsoft, Meta, and Amazon, which are all kind of your AI cloud plays that have performed, you continue to perform really well. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your Apple, your Google, and your Tesla, which all have kind of struggled recently for various reasons. Apple because of, you know, stagnating sales of the iPhone, issues in China, et cetera. And regulatory. And regulatory. And, and, Europe, um, yeah. and uh, you know, Google sort of with the absolutely calamitous um, sort of, uh, you know, outlaying of, of, of their AI, uh, Gemini, yeah. which, which obviously has gotten, I was, you know, pilloried in the market um, and then Tesla, which, um, has, is, is down like, you know, 40, 45% over the past six months. Right. So you've kind of had this trifurcation again in that market alone. So, you know, this, the group together is still up 12% this year, 12% plus, but really the dispersion between the names has increased That's pretty significantly this mm -hmm. year. Yeah. yeah. So when we think about managing this, right, you're managing multiple moving parts. Number one, you're managing just sheer concentration, right? It sounds like in a market. nightmare. Yeah. I mean, like you're managing a market and a core allocation that is now really concentrated. You know, I think number two, you're managing again, rate sensitivity. These, yeah. these stocks are moving in slightly different directions, but they're still all sort of uh, exposed to what the Fed does and what rates do. And that's why it's a big reason why we've seen stock bond correlations rise, right? Because right. you do have this cohort dominating the market. And the third thing again is new. It's like, how do you manage the mag seven, which is now basically its own asset class, right? Mm -hmm. Do you right. start to actively manage it? Do you look to overweight the underperforming names like Apple and Google? Do you do you sort of ride the winners like Nvidia? There's there's a lot of questions that come up that are going to be really important to portfolio yeah, construction yeah. In the next year. All right, so um, I this is a tough one. Which one do we advance? I, I'm gonna I know my vote, which is that we should advance the cash on the sidelines because that is one large pool that's going to move. In one direction, you, to your point, flows matter. Mm -hmm. But I'm open yeah. to discussion. What does everyone else think? No, I, I think Andrew's point on the Mag Seven. It's such a narrow uh, set of considerations. I mean, there's many considerations, but it's involving such a narrow kind of relationship between these stocks, interest rate effect on these stocks, and it's a challenge for investors. But in terms of what moves markets, I, I, I tend to think that six trillion dollars in cash is a lot. And if that cash does start getting off the sidelines and into the game, Rob, you're, you're, that can we, make you're an I mean, that, you, was, I that was the one I was arguing. So I got, I got, <laughs> yeah, I got, can't complain I got about to ride that. the hot hand. Wow. Right? Well, and I think to Andrew's point, and this is where we'll like get us down to the final four now, um, you know, the idea that interest rates are also still a key driver of that magnificent seven bundle yeah. mm -hmm. to me speaks to you know, bringing something more in like inflation or Fed rate cuts right. as a bigger presence. It, yeah. It driving markets over the next and year. And one more thing I would add is sort of when you think about managing the mag seven, part of managing it is figuring out how to get exposure to assets that diversify that mm -hmm. exposure. Right. And 
you could argue that folks have a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines right now, and they have, they have the ability to sort of step into those t- those types of asset classes that do yeah. offer diversification. So yeah. I will allow Rob this victory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll wrap this up with our final four, um, which is inflation, Fed rate cuts, the U.S. middle market, and cash on the sidelines. Um, I'll take inflation uh, very quickly, which um, I put right up against Fed rate cuts. And I guess now I found myself sort of arguing against myself because it's the same issue. Um, yeah. I have constantly thought that inflation, consistently thought inflation is going to be uncomfortably persistent, that the Fed is only going to have the room to cut rates surgically two to three times at this second half of the year. Um, that is significantly less than markets expect. I am going to uh, push inflation as the broadest market mover, because I think it's going to keep upward pressure on long-term interest rates. I think those upward interest rates are going to force some recalibration of um, expected returns and equities. And, um, and I think that this idea that, um, you know, the economy is, is solid, but there's no urgency to, to cut rates. I think that is going to be really the dominant factor in markets. And I think, you know, interestingly, and I I don't really know why this is, but you've seen this major change in expectations for Fed rate cuts this year. And the impact, you know, to treasury rates and markets has not been that That significant. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, we were looking at this the other day, the, the Fed rate curve and the path for rates is not that different than October of last year when 10 year was at 5%. Right. Mm-hmm. But this time right. rates only went from yeah, 380 to 415, like right. a much more muted impact that maybe the market a, yeah. is just not as reactionary to changes in Fed rate cut expectations right yeah. now yeah. than it was even for much of the past yeah. you know, 24 months. Meanwhile, you know, inflation is still impacting the economy. It's still impacting consumer sentiment. Yeah. Um, and I think for companies, it's going to impact, you know, their wage costs and, you know, a lot of other factors. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Pricing power. A lot of other factors that are going to really impact their profitability and performance. So I'm going to stick with inflation. Um, Should we, uh, why don't we break down um, U.S. middle market, which has also made our final four with cash in the sidelines for Alan and Rob. Yeah, absolutely. And I I like how our final four is shaken out because on the one side of the bracket, you have inflation and and Fed rate cuts, which are really out of investors' control. But on this side of the bracket, you have U.S. middle market and cash on the sidelines, which are very much within investors' control. And so as as That's as we talk point. about the U.S. Well middle market, you know, this is an area where uh, you've got uh, expanded opportunity of your investment set. You've got, you know, 19,000 private companies uh, with annual revenues over 100 million. You compare that to the public markets, it's just 2,800 public companies with that level of revenue. You've got, you know, these, these companies in the middle market are still growing. They're hiring at, at, at fast rates. Yeah. You know, over, over the past year, 59% of middle market firms increased the size of their workforce at a rate of nearly 10%. I'm seeing Rob, uh, I'm seeing Rob yeah, want to push a, back I on mean, his it, argument. No, it's a, it's a tough one. I agree. I mean, the, and these two are kind of interrelated because, you know, as we sit here at an alternative investment firm and we just see the flows of capital from investors moving into the middle market, it's sort of interesting. Like you're talking about cash on the sidelines, but where has been a big source of cash and where has that gone into a lot of private investments that are fueling private equity and private credit mm-hmm. in some of these areas the where growth of that they're, part of they're the really yeah. targeting yeah, sure. the U.S. middle market. Yeah. So it's the two are almost kind of inter- intertwined to a to an extent. Um, well, you guys have to pick which one of these is. I would argue that like. The U.S. middle market is sort of the proxy for the powerhouse of the U.S. economy, which yeah. is by yeah. extension the powerhouse of the global economy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, to me, that's the bigger yeah, driver. And to your point, while we, while we are patriotic here, you know, <laughs> that is that is the economic reality of the situation, it just is, given yeah. how robust the growth it, is within that segment of the market. No, yeah, I think that's fair. You did all play right, in the Patriot League, Alan, right? I did play in the Patriot League. There you go. <laughs> I mean, it all comes back to it. The, the cash will not flow to the U.S. middle market if the U.S. middle market is not humming along and oh, doing the things that it's been doing. Precisely. That's so. exactly right. Yeah. As we, as we get to our final matchup, 
Um, we hope that everybody here enjoys watching the tournament. If you're in a bracket, uh, we hope you do well. Um, I, I've always done terribly. I have a terrible track record. So I do better with our Market Madness bracket than with any bracket I've ever done related to the tournament. So Rob, we'll all be, uh, we'll all be cheering for the Huskers. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Great. All right, Riding so, the hot hands. Kisei Tomonaga, draining threes. <laughs> it's going to be great. Can't wait. He's hopped up. I is, love it. He year. is. I love yeah. this. All right. Our final matchup here for us is inflation versus the U.S. middle market. Oof. It's a tough one. Is. What is going to impact the markets more in the coming year? Inflation or the U.S. middle market strength? I, I think, I don't know. I would think it's got to be inflation. It's just, it's on every headline, every newspaper, every day. Like the middle market. Every we, every voter we, survey of yeah. what they're concerned about. It's like the, the middle yeah. market, we kind of feel it maybe <laughs> um, because it employs so many people. It's such a key part of the economy. Yeah. But in this media driven, yeah. <laughs> you know, news cycle markets, that we see, yeah. like and markets respond to that. It, we're pounded with inflation and what's happening and yeah. the implications. And, and to your point, it, it does have such an impact on where rates are going to go and what the economy does. Yeah. And, you know, it's such a big, you know, factor in the election and consumer sentiment. Like it, it's, yeah. it's got its tentacles and everything. So I, I would tend to agree. I, I, I'm still buying groceries like I have one bag of groceries and it's $94 and yeah. I'm like how <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel inflation <laughs> yeah you're just buying too many organic things yeah. you know like I do have two teenagers <laughs> <laughs> I buy a lot of groceries <laughs> yeah and uh, you know you know I'll, I'll add it on the inflation side as well too I you know I've, I've argued fervently for the U.S. middle market all along but this situation where I, I do think inflation takes the cake here because look the with you know the difference between in reality, a two percent inflation, a three percent inflation, is is relatively small on a day to day basis. But the reaction function is significant. It affects markets. It affects what rates will do. It affects asset pricing, forward valuations, real returns. Real returns. Yeah. You know, from a financial markets perspective, a, a small change in inflation does have significant yeah. effects, and, both yeah. in the short and long term. And it's not just the level of inflation; it's the uncertainty around inflation. I think too. Yes. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alan, you, you brought a really good game for the U.S. middle market. Really so. <laughs> Well played. <laughs> for his debut, it was an impressive one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well. All right. <laughs> well, this was fun. Any final thoughts? I'm excited to watch some basketball. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's number one. Yeah. All right. We hope for a lot of upsets. Not optimistic this year, but <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, this is one of my favorite episodes that we do. Thank you so much again. And uh, everyone, happy, happy viewing. This episode was recorded at the FS Investments headquarters in Philadelphia's historic Navy Yard. It was produced by the investment research team. It was edited and engineered by Aaron Sherman. Video produced by Melissa Vendetti and copy provided by Harrison Beck. Special thanks to show coordinators Ellie Zhang and Laura Coleman. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.